banking was then followed by 12 years of multi-club fitness ownership and Savvy's business uh, achieved the Fitness Club of the Year award in New Zealand in the year 2005. Since then, so he's sold up his, uh, his ownership within the gyms and his sole focus is now on you and the Max International College for fitness professionals being the owner and director of the college. Sometimes, actually quite a lot of the time, Savvy's known as Detective Savvy. So all of you that didn't put the gold coin in there, he was watching. He was watching. <laughs> so it teaches a lot more about managing business risks and limiting them for your business. We invite along with Detective Savvy. Savvy. Yes, Savvy. So I um, have the opportunity to speak. But a little, it's a little bit ironic um, to talk about risk. Um, I did spend a huge part of my career in banking um, analysing risk um, in other people's businesses and other people's um, um, lives, I suppose, because we had a huge influence when we said yes and when we said no as a bank. Um, and yet during that whole time, I was a very unhealthy person. Um, and it's somewhat ironic, I suppose, that I'm now talking to a group of uh, world-class fitness professionals about risk. Uh, I was pretty good at managing risk in other people's lives, but not very good at managing the risk in my life. Um, but fortunately, one day, I happened to uh, make a, a decision to make some change, uh, to make different choices that I made up to that particular point. Um, and I came in contact with a couple of guys called Rod and Phil, who were personal trainers. That's in 1993. Um, quite a long time ago, uh, for some of you who were very young then. Um, and they were very early personal trainers, as far as personal trainers go. Um, and they took me under their wing. Uh, and I'm forever grateful for them because it changed my life and it changed the career path that I ultimately went down. Uh, the day I uh, signed up with Rod and Phil, I weighed 130 kgs. Um, so I'm very passionate about um, what we do and why we do it and the difference that they made uh, in my life. So it's somewhat ironic, perhaps, that I'm talking about risk. Um, and, you know, I'm going to share as much of you as I can uh, with you today about how to manage risk in your uh, business. The reality is, however, um, risk is everywhere in our personal lives. What I'd like to do is pose a question to everybody. Big hand, big right hand. Who's taken some risks in their life in the last month? Let's see your hand up really high. Fantastic. Who's taken some risks today? Fantastic. The reality is we take risk every minute of every single day. We sometimes just don't realise it. But over our 20, 30, 40, close to 50 in my case, years of learning, we've learned to um, manage those risks and to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis with the benefit of all of that learning in the past. In terms of the four stages of learning, what are they? Who, of our fitness professionals, who wants to jump up and share them really, really loudly um, for the camera? And what are the four stages of learning that we go through? Right, fantastic. So the four stages, starting at the top, Unconscious competence. You just do it without even knowing you're doing it because you're relying on the experiences of your life and you just do it automatically. There's conscious competence where you've actually got to think about the things that you do a little bit to one degree or another. Then there's conscious incompetence. You're consciously aware of the things that you don't know. And then there's conscious, unconscious incompetence. You don't know what you don't know. In the reality of our personal lives, we much, very much spend most of our time in the unconscious competence. We just do it without even realising we do it. Some of the things that we'll share a little bit about, we have to be consciously competent. But the reality, perhaps, as we start in our, out in our business careers, we're very much unconsciously incompetent. And we, over time, become, start to become consciously incompetent. And if we keep persevering and we, and we achieve a degree of success, we can move up and become consciously competent and unconsciously competent, which is the goal. So let's have a look at some of these examples up here of everyday life. We'll pick one out. Let's the, the kids playing in the surf. From a very early age, we teach our children to, to swim because we know the risks of getting into the surf can be quite dangerous. We teach them about the need to swim between the, the flags. We teach them that those guys who wear the orange, sorry, the yellow um, shirts with the red writing all over it are going to look after them if they get into trouble. And as we go through our lives, we get into the water comfortable with the risks that we are taking, and we often don't think anything about it. But every time we do, we are taking a risk. How about the out on the bike? Who can remember the first time they ever learned to, or taught a child to ride a bike, or learned to ride the bike themselves? So don't ride into the tree, so what do they do? 
they ride into the tree because they're focusing on the tree. But over time, we learn to be able to ride the bike and it becomes almost like second nature. Who hasn't ridden a bike for 10 years? Hands up. Anyone? If you think you get on the bike, you better ride it pretty much straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're going to be able, you will be nervous, but you're going to get on and those memories will come flooding back and you will become consciously competent again very, very quickly. For me, I do a lot of bike riding now. I would regard myself as unconsciously competent, which probably nearly got me into a, a little bit of trouble when I was um, riding in Italy recently, not concentrating enough and nearly riding on the wrong side of the road and getting collected by a car. Cell phones. Who in the room still talks on their phone in the car? Hands up really high. Be honest, guys. Absolutely. What are we doing when we make that decision? I think we're actively going through a decision-making process about whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing to do. It just happens in our, in our conscious mind and our subconscious mind. We take the risk to do it. We've weighed up the risk of being stopped by a traffic officer and being fined. And gee, tell us all what the cost of that is. Okay. And the discount was? Yep. $300. Okay. So we not only go through a risk assessment that we're going to do it because it suits our decision making process at that time. It's important. We, don't, we haven't gone out and made a decision to invest in a Bluetooth capability that gives us the ability to talk without the hands on the phone in our car. We're going through that decision making process and going through a risk evaluation without even realising we're doing it. The picture down the bottom of the food at the, uh, at the buffet. <laughs> Who's ever been up to a buffet and said, oh, you know, I like the look of that, I'll have some of that. Oh, that looks a, bit, looks, looks a bit dodgy. You don't necessarily articulate it out loud, but you just make that instant decision and you bypass it. You're going through a risk evaluation process without even realising you're doing it. You're making a decision to eat it or a decision not to eat it. And for those of you who have made, a bit, made bad decisions around that in the past, you'll have experienced food poisoning and it can be <laughs> pretty tragic, as you know. What about these guys walking across the street, the Beatles? They probably closed the, the road that particular day. But how many times a day do you cross the road? Instinctively, we look right and we look less, left and we make a risk decision as to when is the right time to go and when is the not, not the right time to go. And who's nearly been caught out? Because they weren't quite concentrating. You weren't quite on the job at that particular point in time. But we do go through that risk evaluation process in our mind and we make a decision and we act. And most of the time those decisions are pretty good. Fortunately, we don't get hit by a car very often. Getting on a plane is actually safer than driving a car. But we go through a decision that we need to get from A to B, so we're going to fly, so we are going to take that risk. But when planes crash, do many people survive? No. So if you are one of those unfortunate people, then the probability of you surviving is very low, but you make the assessment that the risk is low, I'm going to take that risk because it's important to me in achieving my goals or the decisions that I need to make to move my personal life or my business life forward. The bungee. Who's done a bungee? I did one in Queenstown at, on the pipeline, and um, my risk management process that particular day was about five glasses of wine. <laughs> and about three bourbons and Cokes, um, and a lot of prayer, peer pressure because I wasn't the first one to jump. So, um, but at the end of the day, I knew the risks. I was probably slightly, my judgment was slightly um, clouded, but I did make the decision to jump. And I knew really that I don't think anyone has ever been killed doing a bungee jump in a commercial operation that I'm aware of. I think some people have been, has there? I know some people have been injured, but it's not very common. So the decision to jump, while it was a tough decision, I did it. And hey, the adrenaline rush that I got from it was pretty amazing. Did you just do one recently, Abe? Uh, yeah, I've done a couple of recently. Right, fantastic. And the last one, which is in terms of our personal lives, is probably the most complicated. And anyone who becomes unconsciously competent in a relationship is probably much closer to unconscious incompetence than they really know, and they're probably heading towards a slippery slope uh, really early. But we do things in our relationships without knowing that we do them in order to uh, ensure that they're successful. Um, we say things, we do things, some big things, some little things, but they happen because of the learning that we've been through. And when we don't do them, we get reminded that we haven't done them, which adds to our learning.
So what I want to make a point is that risk is everywhere in our lives. It's just that we are, in our personal lives, so much more comfortable with it. We've lived with it from, every, from, from the day we were born. And all the learning and the experiences we've gone through our childhood, with our brothers and sisters, with our mothers and fathers and the people that we've had around in our circle of influence has allowed us to manage those risks and by and large manage those risks really, really well. Sometimes we come unstuck. Who's come unstuck in their personal lives? I've got my hand up really well. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, that was part of the learning process that we were going through. So now we're going to have a look at it in, in business, because business is risky. Okay. They've come together with a quote, which hopefully one day will rank up there with something from Marcus Aurelius or, or something like that. But if it doesn't, then, then that's okay. In business, some people make their fortunes and some lose everything. Losing everything is really a case of bad luck. It's most often the point at which ignorance, arrogance, and inaction collide. Ignorance. Who's heard the saying, ignorance is bliss? Well, clearly ignorance is not bliss. Um, what you don't know will hurt you. Unlike the saying, what you don't know won't hurt you. What you don't know in your business will potentially hurt you at some point in time. So to be ignorant of those things is just increasing the possibility of those things occurring at some point in the future. So it's about addressing ignorance and arrogance and inaction to ensure that you're aware of the risks before they impact on you before they hit your bottom line, before they hit your ability to have the things in, the life that you, in your life that you want. So why do businesses fail? It's, a, it's pretty simple. Who's ever heard of a business that's failed when they've had plenty of cash? Okay. This doesn't happen, does it? It's simply when they run out of cash to meet the needs of the business and or the needs of the owner. Because if there's enough cash in the business to meet the needs of the business and to meet the needs of the owner, then the business will not fail. Who knows some statistics around business failure? 90% of businesses fail within the first two years. Can, nice and loud? 90% of small businesses fail within the first two years. Yeah. Now, if you get online and you do some research on that, there's, there's some interesting information around the accuracy of 90%. But the bottom line is it's a very, very high number. Often we say 95% of all small business in 90, 90, 90, 95, neither here nor there. But the truth is there's not a lot of statistics out there. But lots and lots of small businesses fail. Lots and lots of big businesses fail. And some of them appear in the paper. Some, some of them appear on the national news. And some of them keep appearing on the news for weeks and weeks. But most of them just close their doors. Most of them are the personal trainer that you were working alongside who didn't show up to work on Monday, who made a decision that they no longer could do it any longer. They didn't have enough cash to meet the needs of the business or, their, or themselves personally, so they made a decision to move on. And that's really, really sad. Uh, but it is the reality of being in business, and some of those things are avoidable, and most of them are. Cause it occurs because income is too low and our expense is too high. Very simple, isn't it? And Dr. J, and when I spent a lot of time this morning talking to you about how you can drive what up? Sales and your income. And if you drive your income up and you're successful in achieving that, the probability of failure in terms of business from a financial standpoint is substantially diminished, providing you also manage your expenses and the relationship between fixed costs and variable costs we're not going to get into but you need to manage your expenses you need to live within your income it's interesting that we go into business and we do a profit and loss account who does a profit and loss account for their personal lives we've got one person in the room perhaps we should manage our business affairs and our, f our personal affairs in a similar manner and understand what our income and what our expenses are so in order, we, in order to know what we have to do and when we need to drive our income up and our expenses down to create profit because that's what we're in business for because profit gives us the instrument to do the things that we want to do to grow our business, to employ more people, to open more studios, to build gyms to develop new products, to have the things that you want in your personal life so the solution is understanding and managing the factors or the risks that influence income 
and influence expenditure. I'm going to try and focus on that for the rest of the session. Okay. So the starting point. Come up with an acronym around the word cause, because it's cause and effect. The cause of your success will be the things that you do that make you successful. The cause of the failure will be the things that you don't do or the things that you overlook that run you over along the way. And the C stands for care. It's the starting point. If you don't care about risk and the risk that can come along and get you, then make that a conscious decision and just see where you end up. You might be one of the fortunate few who goes through successfully your entire business life and don't get caught out by any of those major risks. But if you do care about them, and I suggest strongly that you should, the next step in the process is to be aware of what the risks are. It's great to care about them, but if you're not aware of the risks that you need to be concerned about, then it's going to be very hard to develop some strategies to manage them. So firstly, care about them, and secondly, be aware of them. And then you have to learn to understand them. And I think you'll find you're aware of a lot more risks than you recognise. You just haven't devoted the time and effort to thinking about them. And understanding the risk is equally important. And as you're going through that learning stages, for some of you, some of those risks may be very, very difficult to understand. Who are you going to look to to help you with that? People within your circle of influence that you've taken on board to help you be successful, to get them to help you to understand the risks. And once you understand what the risks are, you can move on to the S, which is some, develop some strategies to either manage, mitigate, or potentially even remove the risk entirely. And then the E for cause is then to evaluate your success in achieving that or not. It's fantastic to put strategies in place into your business, but if you don't actually then evaluate how they're working, how do you know whether it's the right decision or not? Do you need to tweak it? Do you need to change it? Do you need to start again? So cause, cause and effect, the cause of your success, the cause of avoiding those risks that can be very, very significant and very, very damaging to the business. So, what is risk in business terms? I'd like to think of it in three different categories. We have whether it's external to the business or whether it's internal to the business, and I'll come back and talk about some examples of that. The second area of focus is whether it would have, if it was to take place, whether it would be a significant impact on the business or whether it would have a minor impact on the business. So we're dealing with impact. And the next category is probability of the risk occurring. Is it a high probability of the risk occurring or is it a low probability of the risk occurring? And with this set of information, I'm going to show you a matrix that you can put into, put all of your risks into so you can identify where your focus and where your energies should go. So external is external to the business. Things over which you have limited or no control. And there's some examples of it up there, economy, the economy. Who in this room can control the economy? Okay. So it's external to you, but you need to be aware of it, but can you control it? There are some things that within the economy that you may be able to influence. Who could think what they might be in terms of managing risk within your business? Sorry? You could vote effectively. Interestingly, in Australia last week, where we were, there wasn't a lot of effective voting going on, so now they've got a, an economy that has a lot more risk in it than it did the previous, well, the previous week. How about interest rates? As an example of risks that are driven by the economy that you can have some ability to influence by using, um, for example, who knows about locking in their interest rate to go into a fixed rate option if you've got money, money borrowed. An example of a simple strategy. That could be environmental. What would be a big example of an environmental risk over which you have no control? Cyclone? How about an earthquake? Because I think everywhere in New Zealand is um, on the map for a major earthquake at some point in time in the future. But I don't think they're talking necessarily our lifetime, but who's to say it doesn't come next week? And in fact, some of the stuff that I've read about Christchurch, if the earthquake that they're predicting actually comes, it will liquefy. Do you know what I mean by liquefy? 
It'll basically, because it's a loop built on an alluvial plane, it'll shake and rattle itself and everything will just disappear into the, disappear into the ground if it is the major earthquake they're predicting will come our way at some point in the future. Political influence. The changes that take place as a consequence of a change of government, for example, uh, changing um, employment laws that are taking pla have taken place in New Zealand can influence the risk that you accept in your business. They are external to the business. You cannot specifically control them, but you need to be aware of them because there are some things that you potentially can do to mitigate some of those risks. We have internal risks. So you have expense levels within the business, which you can entirely manage. The management of the business, whether that's you or whether that's people that you bring on your team to do it, they are a risk that you take on board in your business and you need to be aware of it and manage it. Loss of clients is an internal risk. Who expects to lose some clients? So accepting that it's a major risk within your business, it's a risk that needs to be managed and needs to have some strategies in place to manage and mitigate that. And Rowie talked an awful lot about what needs to be done in that particular area. So some examples of some internal risks. Then we have the impact issues. Significant impact. Would a fire be a significant impact on your business? Potentially. You know, you could have built a really successful PT business, a very successful gym, uh, a very successful um, business, and suddenly a fire comes along and destroys the entire thing overnight. You are out of business. So that's an example of something that could have significant impact. Recession. Would have a, could have a significant, and has had a significant impact in the New Zealand economy. It's interesting, the impact in Australia seems to be less than it has been in New Zealand, but it will have a significant impact on your business, and certainly has in New Zealand. Loss of database. Imagine if, how would you feel, Paul, if you lost your entire um, club physical database, just sort of something happened and just disappeared into the ether. It would be, a, <laughs> it would be an incredibly fascinating challenge. Start again the next day. And it, and, and it has happened, and it probably will happen again in the future, and it would be a massive impact on the business. It could be your entire database, it could just be part of your membership, it could be some financial data, it could be something that happens to your laptop because you haven't got, because you live, everything is on your laptop, but you don't have adequate stuff back, uh, backup systems in place to ensure you don't lose it. Minor impact, an equipment breakdown. Because generally speaking, you can get that piece of equipment fixed um, quite quickly. So generally speaking, equipment breakdowns have minor impact. Theft in most businesses has minor impact. Although there have been some pretty amazing cases through the papers recently about some of the theft that's gone on in some organisations. And I don't know if you know, but employee theft is regarded as the biggest industry in New Zealand. Did you know that? Fact. The amount of theft and all its various forms that takes place in employ by employees in New Zealand as a massive industry, if you want to look at like it as an industry. The cost that it has to employers is truly enormous. Then we look at probability, the probability of something happening. Staff turnover, loss of people. There's a high probability that people in your business, some of which you want to lose, and some of who you don't want to lose, will move on and so there's a high probability of that taking place. Whether, is a, whether, it's likely or, whether it's likely or not, there's a high probability at some point in time you will face that challenge. Client attrition is another one with high probability. Not necessarily because they don't like you, they don't, they've stopped trusting you, just because they move or other circumstances in their life come along. And then those with low probability. It is quite low probability that there's going to be a major fire that damages or puts you out of business completely, or a low probability that in our lives there will be that earthquake that liquefies the entire Christchurch city. Uh, I don't plan to be there if it happens, hopefully, <laughs> but if it does, it would be surely catastrophic. Client injury. Has anyone ever injured a client in this room? Okay. A couple. So it's reasonably low probability, particularly given what you know and if you apply your knowledge and your skills well. It may happen, but it's a low probability of happening. And fraud 
is just another one of example where it's actually a low, uh, low probability. So now you understand the three categories that you need to focus on. Is it an external risk over which I have not much control? Is it an internal risk over which I have 100% control? Is the risk something that would have a significant impact in my business or is it something that would have a low impact or a minor impact or whereabouts in between? And once I understand that, I need to understand the probability. Am I worrying about something that's very unlikely to happen or am I worrying about something that's almost certainly going to happen? All right. So what I want to do now is just get you guys to have a quick look at your businesses or alternatively your proposed businesses if you're not out there yet doing it. And what I'd like you to do is write down the two biggest risks that are currently facing your business. Okay? And then I'd like you to categorize them as either an external or internal risk. And secondly, whether it would be a high impact or a low impact if it was to eventuate. And, sec and thirdly, whether it's a high probability or a low probability. Okay? Two risks and categorize it. So it might be, for example, um, um, you might say that the biggest risk facing your business is fire, just because it's an easy one. It's an external risk or an internal risk. What do you think? Correct. It's primarily an internal risk. The external factor could come in if someone throws a um, Molokov cocktail through your window. There's that external factor. But primarily focusing from it's an internal risk. Would it be high impact or low impact? High impact. High probability or low probability? So if we use the example of fire, we're saying it's internal with high impact and low probability. So the two risks in your business or the two risks that you see coming in the business that you are about to launch. Okay? And we're going to ask some of you to share. And Rowie's going to share one of ours too, aren't you, Rowie? Yep. Dr. Jay, can you just flick the music for a couple of... You can't do? Yep, just for a couple of ticks while everyone writes those two risks. Now what I'm going to do for everybody is in the next few days we're going to email you a copy of the PowerPoints and three pages of risks that I've come together with that will identify pretty much every risk that I could ever think of from my days in banking that may face your business or businesses at some point in the future. But I didn't want to give you that now because I want you to start to think a little bit about your business as it is now. What are the risks that you face or have you even ever thought about them? And if you're sitting there now struggling to write them down, that's telling that you, A, that you haven't thought about them, and B, that you are in the unconscious, incompetent stage, which is also a message to you that it's time to change. Okay. Thanks, Dr. J. Who would like to offer something up? Injury to yourself. Injury to yourself. Okay. Which is nice and loudly for the camera. Injury to yourself would be... External or internal? Internal. Yep, fantastic. Yep. High impact or low impact? High impact, fantastic. And high probability or low probability? Yep, yep, a medium probability. There's a scale, I just picked the two ends of the scale. Yep, so medium probability. So if you were injured, as a and that took place, what's it going to mean for your business? What's it going to mean for your income? Um, yeah. Yeah. Could potentially put pressure on the income down. Your expense levels, generally speaking, will remain the same because a large number of the costs we have in our business are fixed. Uh, and as a consequence, it puts pressure on the profit and your ability to meet your commitments and to have the things that you want in your personal life. What would be a strategy, and we're going to get in too much into it now, to address that risk within your business? Fantastic. Okay. We'll talk a lot about insurance um, at the end. That's a great, great example. Thanks for that. Hey. Loss of tech. Okay, so loss of your mobile phone 
okay, which would be external or internal. Internal, unless someone flogged it uh, in some way. Yep. High impact or low impact? High impact, yep. And high probability or low probability? Medium? Okay. All right, so what would be a strategy? You're concerned about losing your phone because what's it got on it? Client details. Yep, so what would be a strategy to manage that risk? A backup. Some sort of backup system that backs it up to your laptop or backs it up to a central server or some other tool or alternatively, even if you want to be go one step further because you're going to be without your phone, it's backed up to a... You, another phone, you've got to, actually you've got another phone at your disposal, so if something like that was to happen, you can immediately pick up the phone and you're back in business, you don't have to shag around going down to uh, the mall or whatever to try and get another phone. Sorry? <laughs> okay, one more before we go to Rome. Uh, last week was get pregnant, not that that's going to be Okay. Um, the strategy for that is not Yeah, correct. <laughs> is, that an in, is that an external or an internal risk? Both. Both. <laughs> High impact, yeah. So um, how do you manage that risk? There is, you do have to, if, if, if part of your life plan is to have children, how do you manage that risk? You've got to build up enough cash reserves so that you can develop a succession plan to employ someone or to, to recruit someone, attract someone, recruit them, train them so that they can take over and run your business while you have the baby. And we've got a living example of that, of that here. The interesting yeah. one was last week, though, was I don't think they ever thought that that baby was going to be an issue. But the mindset, she has a mindset that completely changed. Mm, absolutely. And that's going to create a big risk for you. So in terms of the cause, um, and Akram, which part of there was missing? C is caring, because they do care. A was aware. Yeah, they weren't aware of the risk. Because clearly having a baby was going to create some risk within the business, but they weren't aware of what that risk therefore was. Therefore, they didn't take the time to understand that risk. Therefore, they never took the time to develop a strategy to prepare themselves for it and therefore never put themselves in a position where they could evaluate that risk on an ongoing basis anyway. Yep, right. Does everyone know what that is? It's about you know, having a website that, that when you click into Google and you put in personal training course, that you just appear up the, up the top in the sponsored links or, or, or over time you become a long way up the generic listings. Now, for someone like me who's a very strong DC personality, not understanding that stuff really gives me the... Yeah. It's like you don't want to, you don't want to get me going. But is that an external risk or an internal risk? Does everyone understand what we're talking about? Making sure we appear far enough up the tree that people see Max when they're inquiring online for personal training. Is that an external or an internal risk? For us at the moment, it's external because we're relying on an external party to do it for us. Maybe we should make it an internal risk to, to take responsibility for doing it ourselves. High impact or low impact? Extremely high impact. If we don't appear there when someone goes searching for a personal training course, we're toast. So it's extremely high pro uh, impact. High probability or low probability? At the moment, it's a high probability because we, our, our, our investment in that area is not working for us. So we are, what are some of the strategies? We're, we've changed the party that we are using to do our website optimization for us. And now we're just getting a different story from a different set of people that we're not 100% sure whether we're being told the truth or not. But that's the process we're going through because we're going through a lot of learning because really in terms of website optimization, optimization we're still unconsciously incompetent, incompetent, working hard to try and get to a point where we are consciously incompetent. Okay. So that's an area for us which has huge impact. Alrighty, so managing risk. Is it about throwing a dart at a dartboard? No, it's not. The probability of that dart ending up where it needs to is very, very low. So what are your options? Okay, with risk, you either accept it. Because if we've established that you care about it and you, you're aware of it and you understand it, um, yeah, sometimes you just have to accept it because it's not worth worrying about. There's nothing that you can do about it. And by worrying about it, you're giving yourself grief. There's one big example of that. Who knows what that is? In any business, any business faces it. 
begins with C. Competition. You cannot control what your competitors do. You cannot control someone opening up next to you. You cannot, con well, you may in certain situations if you're more and you've got restrictions on leases, but um, generally speaking, you cannot stop them from setting up right beside you or taking you head on. So you just need to accept that risk and move on. Or alternatively, if, the, if that is one of the risks, what could you do in regards to that? So that you can compete effectively. You can't change the fact that you're going to be competing, but what could you do to enable yourself to be able to compete more effectively? Be incredibly successful and incredibly profitable, so what have you got? You've got a war chest that means you can, you can fight them. You can handle the competition. You're prepared to be able to deal with it, but you're not going to worry about it. You're just going to continue to do what you do, but be confident in what you're doing, but you're knowing that you're making enough profits and you've got enough in your war chest to be able to fight the fight when it needs to be fought. Well, you can transfer it onto a third party. And the classic way that we transfer risk onto a third party is what? Insurance. And there are so many things that you can insure, and we'll talk a lot about that shortly. Or you can eliminate it. And really the only way you can eliminate a risk, by and large, is to change your market, change your product. Stop doing something that you're currently doing, otherwise the risk is going to continue in some shape or form in your business. And sometimes you have to make that choice. The risk is just too great. The risk is just too expensive to manage, therefore I'm going to stop doing that or I'm going to move or I'm going to make a significant change. So here's the risk management model, which I hope all of you will adopt and uh, migrate the risks that exist in your business into the model as a really key starting point to starting to manage them. Down this column we have the risk factor based on whether its impact. So that's on the vertical axis, if you like, of the graph of the, of the model. Across the bottom we have the probability factor. We've taken out the external and internal for the purpose of this because it's not as, as a significant an issue. You then have to identify what are all the risks that your business faces, from the little ones right the way through to the really big ones that you've just spent a couple of times, a couple of minutes writing down now. The big ones that you've identified, wh which box would they be in? Down here or up here? up here, because that is a significant risk with potentially high impact. So you put the, the risk that you've identified in the box that relates to the axis on the graph. So high risk, significant impact requires extensive management is essential. Okay. If you've got something that is very, very low risk, um, minor risk of impact, low probability, it's going to be in the bottom left where the decision may be just to simply accept the risks and get on with business. Okay. And all the different degrees. In this box up here we've got a significant impact but a low risk but it requires considerable management. Okay. So if you took every single risk that you have in your business and plotted them into these particular boxes, that's a fantastic starting point because in terms of cause, what have you now created a huge amount of? You care about it, clearly, because you've taken the time to sit down and do this. You've now created a huge amount of awareness, awareness of the risk, because it's there, it's a, in a simple picture for you to read. Now you've got to take the time to understand them a little bit more and then work on developing the strategies to manage them or mitigate them or remove them entirely. Okay. How many risks do you think an average business might have in a, in a model like that? What would you expect to see? Potentially hundreds. You don't want to become tied up in so much detail that you lose, you can't see the wood for the trees, but don't be surprised if you end up with 10 or 15 significant ones in here that require your attention. And that you start the process of learning and start the process of managing those risks straight away rather than waiting until it's what? It's too late. <laughs> Because when it's too late, it's too late, and that's when it's going to cost you a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of grief, um, and um, potentially, ultimately, the failure of your business. Okay. So the key risk management tools, planning. Evaluate the past and plan for the future. Show of hands, 
honest, because I know what I, I know what I'm going to see. So, who at this particular point in time, who's actually operating a business, has a comprehensive business plan in place? Right hand up. Okay, so we've got about five hands. For those of you who are currently operating a business, put your hand up if you don't currently have a comprehensive business plan in place, which is roughly what I would have expected to see. It's a bit like the 80-20 rule again playing itself out in just a different example. If you go on a journey, you need a plan. <laughs> Otherwise, you're surely going to end up somewhere, but you've just got no idea where it is you're going to end up. You know, if you got in your car and start driving, then you will end up somewhere. But if you actually want to go get in your car and drive to a particular location, you'll do a bit of research, you'll have a map, you'll have a lot of resources at your disposal, so you end up where you plan and business is no different. You need to have a business plan because that's the blueprint that you follow. Information. I love information because the score always tells the story. So if you've got quality financial information available to you, quality operational information, and we, Steve talked a lot about you know, the amount of uh, uh, appointments that you're creating, the number of phone calls you're making, the number of appointments you create, the number of your close rate, your show rate, all of those sorts of things should be available to you to know whether you are maximising the opportunities that exist in your business. Otherwise, you're going to manage your business and make decisions in a vacuum. Okay. And information about the industry, which there's enormous amount of information available um, through Fitness New Zealand, through REPS, through URSA, the International Health and Racket Sport Club Association, through MAX, you've just got to go looking for it. And if you wanted to talk to um, Paul about his experience in the industry, what do you have to do? Ask. I imagine, Paul, you'd be happy to give your time to somebody who wanted to learn a bit about the industry. Yeah, absolutely, because there's a whole huge amount of knowledge out there. You've just got to be prepared to go looking for it and ask someone to spend the time with you. You have to have policies, which are the rules of engagement, the things that you, the big rocks, the things that you will do and the things that you won't do. Are you, who is going to discount in their business? Okay, so one of the rules, for example, one of the policies is that there is zero, there is no discounting, full stop. That's all that's needed. But it, is, it does need to be stated and it does need to be very clear in the whole series of other rules of engagement that drive and manage your business. And then the systems that flow out from underneath that. Why is McDonald's so successful? Love or hate the product, and most of us, I would hope, hate the product because of what it does, but love or hate the product, that's an enormous business success. It's highly, highly systemized. The experience that you have in one place to another is the same, and the only thing that changes that is what? Human intervention, <laughs> mistakes, people not following the policies and the consequences for franchisees that don't follow the policies and, and the systems in, in uh, McDonald's is pretty catastrophic. I think you know, it's a three strikes and you are, see you later alligator. Okay. Imagine if you didn't follow your own policies and your own systems and you had three strikes and you were out. Well maybe it's a model that you should adopt because otherwise what's the point of having policies and what's the point of having systems in the first place? Governance. What we're talking about is there is good decision-making processes. How do you make decisions in your business? Do you make them by the seat of your pants or you've got a process that you go through? And when you're going and making those decisions, are you thinking about the risks or are you just thinking about in the here and now and yeah, it seems like a good decision to make now without really fully thinking it through? Okay. Good it's great to be decisive. It's great to be someone who makes a decision and acts, but it's also equally good sometimes to pause and sit back and reflect and say, is this the right decision to make for the business? Your advisors, they need to be experienced. They need to be engaged in your business. Because if they're not engaged in your business, how can they help you? And more importantly, I think you need to listen to them. Who's been guilty of having people around them that gives them advice but doesn't listen to them? Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you're going to bring those people into your advice, into your life, doesn't mean that you should blindly listen to them. 
but they're giving you, if they are experienced and they are engaged, maybe you should listen to them a little bit more because they are bringing a fresh perspective into the business and sometimes they can see the wood for the trees where you potentially can't. Personal development is about improving the strengths and working on your weaknesses, which is what coming to a day like today is all about. But you know, this is just part of an ongoing, an ongoing journey. And insurance, both comprehensive business and personal insurance. And I really now want to spend a fair bit chunk of time on, on that. Is it an investment or an expense? The answer's up there. Would you expect to spend a fair chunk of money on insurance in your business and in your personal life? Absolutely. But if you look at it as an expense, you probably never, never spend it. But if you look at it as an investment, you will spend it. And then when something goes wrong, you go, thank God I made that investment. You can insure against most risks, is the truth. There are very, very few risks that you can't insure against. It's all about how much you're prepared to pay. There is a, potentially a premium out there for just about every single risk that you want to take on, but there comes a point where you say, no, I'm not going to spend that money. And you have to make that risk assessment yourself. Insurance is about protecting your capital. It's about in, protecting your profits. It's about protecting your assets. It's about protecting you personally. It's about protecting your family. It's about protecting your future. Imagine working really, really hard and building something really successful and then you drop dead and you've got a family left behind and you've got no insurance in place. How good an outcome would that be? So we start with death insurance. Who has got death cover in place? Fantastic. What a great show of hands. Because, you know, those sort of things happen and when they do happen, you want to ensure that what's left behind is taken care of. Partial or full disablement can also have the same effect. If you're a personal trainer running a fantastically successful studio and you become a quadriplegic or a tetraplegic, do you want the success of that business to continue and for you to enjoy the benefits beyond that injury? Absolutely. Medical insurance, illness. You might get um, heart challenges for some reason. Stress potentially in your business. You need to take some time off. What do you want to happen when you're off sick, de-stressing? You still want the money to come into the bank account each week based on the performance that you've been achieving. And that's why you need great financial information because that's what you're going to provide to the insurance company for them to make the evaluation on providing you the payments under your insurance premiums. And key people. G-Spot's a key person in our business, so maybe we should be insuring G-Spot because if he gets hit by a truck, God forbid, that's a major impact on our business. So as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, you know, I'm talking about stuff that, I, that, you know, that we should all be doing in our business, and I'm saying, yeah, maybe that's just some little light bulb going off in the back of my head. Poor truck, Poor truck yeah. But if you've got those sort of people in the business and they're very important to it, it's not just about insuring you, you can also insure them and the risks that are associated with them. Loss of profits, which we talked about earlier on, as a consequence of these things. Loss of clients. When I had Pro Fitness, we had comprehensive loss of, uh, of profits in place, but we also insured for loss of clients as a consequence of fire, earthquake, and other such events. And what that was about saying was, OK, it's all well and good that I insure for the loss of profit as a consequence of the fire, and you will pay me a certain amount of money based on the profitability that we've historically had up to the date that I reopen the doors of the business. But if I've lost 500 clients while I was uh, getting my business up and going again in two months or three months, I also want to be paid for, I want to be compensated for that permanent loss because it might take me six months or it might take me a year to recover back to where we were as a consequence of the loss of those customers. So it's not about just ensuring the profits that you've had in the past, it's also about the ensuring the profits that you were going to achieve in the future. It's the relocation costs. You can ensure the relocation costs as a consequence of some of these things, fire, um, water damage, other things. And you can ensure for the costs of the 
claim. If you had to file a claim for a major catastrophic loss in your, in your business, how much do you think it might cost you? To file the claim? To, file, to have all the accounting information, to prepare everything, to satisfy their insurer and give it to them. A couple of thousand dollars to get the books yep. signed off at the time and the legals. Yep. And what do you think about that, guys? I think it could be five times that, if not more. By the time you prepare the claim, you get up-to-date accounting information, you go through the whole negotiation process with the insurance company for them to get the muchacho out and actually start putting money into your bank account. And so you can ensure the costs of that claim as part of your insurance. Okay. Plant, equipment, fixtures and fittings, and theft and burglary, you can ensure for all of those sorts of things. And, as you know, public liability and professional indemnity is automatically coming part of, as part of your reps registration. But the question I'd ask is half a million dollars of public liability and half a million dollars of professional indemnity as a consequence of um, being registered with reps enough. Has anyone else in the room got additional professional indemnity and public liability? Congratulations. It's not enough. But at the moment, it's a, uh, you get half a million dollars as, a as part of the registration. But potentially, you need a whole lot more, and, that, and it, can be it should be dealt with as part of the business risks insurance policy that you put in place with your insurance broker. But you can't insure against being lazy. You can't insure against being stupid. You can't insure against the ignorance and the arrogance. Because you know, what you don't know will hurt your ignorance is not bliss, and some of these risks will manifest themselves in your businesses, whether it's next week, next month, or next year, or sometime 10 years down the track, in some shape or form. And someone, unfortunately, might suffer a fire. Someone may suffer a major permanent disability of some description. And the insurance that's available to you is a deductible expense within your business, with some rare exceptions around personal insurances. And it's the most important investment you might ever make in your life. But only if you take steps to actually address it, and that's all about being aware of the risks and putting in place strategies to do something about it. Okay. So one final thought. There are, there are risks and costs to any program of action. But there are far less than the long-range risks and costs of comfortable inaction. And he's a far wiser man than I am, John F. Kennedy. It's important that you are aware of the risks in your business. You need to care firstly. If you don't care, then don't complain when you get hit by the Mack truck. Don't complain when it goes bad. Don't complain when you go out of business as a consequence of not caring. If you do care, then become aware of those risks. If you struggle to be aware of the risk, you need to lean on the people around you that, that are helping you in your business, your mentors, the people within your circle of influence to help you to become aware of those risks. And once you become aware of those risks, take the time to understand them. And some of them aren't that scary. Most of them aren't that scary. But take the time to understand them. And once you understand them, you can develop a whole series of strategies, some of which, like we talked about today, are very, very simple some of them which will involve some investment. But once you've put the strategy in place, continue to evaluate it on an ongoing basis as part of your business planning process and ensure that they are still appropriate and adequate for your business. And if you do that, you should insulate yourself from most risks. And you should insulate yourself to the point where when something does go bad, it will have an impact. But maybe that impact will not be significant. Maybe that impact won't put you out of business. Maybe that impact will teach you something and allow you to grow, recover and grow, and be more successful than you were in the past as a consequence of it. Thanks for today, guys. I want you to um, uh, take the learning and do something with it. If you go away from the day and don't actually do anything and become part of the 80-20 challenge that, that and fix our whole industry and pretty much every single industry, then that's going to be really sad. But if you go away from today with two or three things and you put them into place, then you're almost likely going to guarantee your success. So enjoy the rest of the day. We're going to 
um, hand you back to G and you're going to get a special treat shortly when the K-Man's going to wow you and share some very interesting stories about our uh, recent holiday in, in Italy. Thanks for that, guys. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah.